there are nearly 120 known chemical elements. That's a lot of stuff to keep track of and a lot of information to organize. And the periodic table is the primary tool we use to organize information about the chemical elements. In this video, we're going to talk about the foundations of the periodic table, the essential information that we can pull off of the periodic table, and how to look at it kind of in a rational way, recognizing groupings of elements that follow particular trends in their properties, for example, as well as elements that have properties in common. From their positions on the periodic table, we'll be able to infer some basic ideas about this. And actually, as you advance through your study of introductory chemistry, you'll learn why the periodic table has the structure that it does. There are deep reasons for the structure of the periodic table. We'll say a little bit about that in our lingering questions at the end of this video. So our two learning objectives for today in this video are to use the periodic table to efficiently find information about a chemical element, and then recognizing key collections of elements on the periodic table, specifically associated with the rows and columns. We've got particular terms for the rows and columns, and the rows and columns and elements within have some interesting tendencies, shall we say, that we'll take a look at toward the end of this video. Let's start with the essential information that you get about a chemical element from the periodic table. So the periodic table is a table in which each cell corresponds to one chemical element. The table that really has withstood the test of time started with the Russian chemist Mendeleev in the 19th century, but he was building on even earlier work in the 19th century that recognized trends and patterns in the properties and chemistry of the chemical elements. Mendeleev organized that information into a table, and that has become the modern periodic table. Each entry in the table includes some information about one chemical element. Pretty much every table has these four pieces of information that you see labeled on this slide. The name and the element symbol, so the example here we see the name carbon and the element symbol C. The atomic number, often in the top left, sometimes the top right or, or the top middle. There at the top, that's the number of protons in the nucleus. And then this number below the element name, often at the bottom of the entry, is the average atomic mass. This is a weighted average of all the known naturally occurring isotopes of that element. And the reason this is included and why it's so important and why we use it so much is that this is the macroscopically apparent mass of that element, right? A collection of carbon atoms consists of multiple isotopes, some carbon-12, some carbon-13, some carbon-14. But in any sample of carbon that we're working with macroscopically, absolutely any carbon-containing substance is going to contain an enormous, enormous number of carbon atoms. And so the apparent mass that we see is the average mass of a carbon atom averaged over that huge collection of carbon atoms. And it's an average of the isotopic masses weighted by their abundance, how frequently they occur in that sample of carbon. This is the average atomic mass, and we'll work with it more in future modules. The basic organization of the periodic table looks like this, and it includes columns and rows. Each column is known as a group. Group is the technical term that we use for a column of elements on the periodic table. Each column gets a number, group one, group two, group three, etc. you can see on the slide. And elements within a group, elements in a common column, have analogous properties and reactivity. So just to give you an example, group 17 over here on the right are known as the halogens. The halogens form anions with a charge of negative 1, and they're frequently diatomic in their elemental form. We'll talk about what that means at the end of the video. One thing we'll notice is that all four of these elements get together with another, two atoms get together in the elemental form to form, for example, F2 molecules, Cl2, Br2, and I2. This is kind of what we mean by consistent properties, consistent properties of the element. All the elements are diatomic in group 17, for example. And the same is true of the other groups in terms of having analogous properties and reactivity. All the elements in group 16 have things in common, group 15, etc. The rows are known as periods. For example, you see here boxed in blue, period 2. And notice that period 2 runs all the way across here. There's this big gap where we don't see any elements in groups 3 through 12 in period 2, but 
all of these elements across this entire row are the second period of the periodic table. And the reason this is called a period is that frequently across a period there's a consistent trend in a property. Maybe it consistently goes up or consistently goes down, but that trend resets when we get to the next row. And so the elements display what we call periodicity in their properties. A property goes down, 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 down until we hit the end of a period. And then when we go from the end of one period to the beginning of another, that property kind of resets and then it goes down, 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 down again. And so graphs of the properties of the elements as a function of atomic number have a periodic appearance, something that you'll see in more detail in your introductory chemistry course. Probably the most important course distinction between the elements on the periodic table is the metal, non-metal distinction. Most of the elements on the periodic table are metals. They're silvery or dark colored solids. They're electrically and thermally conductive. They're malleable, meaning we can mold them into various shapes. They tend to form cations. They're oxidizable and they're found mostly in ionic compounds. They tend not to form covalent bonds. A smaller number of elements in the top right of the periodic table, as we'll see, are the nonmetals. These are solids, liquids, or most commonly gases of various colors. They're electrically insulating, they're reducible, frequently they form anions, and they're typically found in covalent bonds. The atoms bond covalently to form molecular or covalent compounds. There are a few elements that exist on the gray frontier, the gray area between metal and nonmetal. These are known as the metalloids, and boron is a classic example. They might be semiconductive electrically, not pure conductors, but not exactly insulators. They may form covalent bonds or bond ionically, depending on the situation. And many of these elements have multiple forms, and they're elemental forms, some of which are more metallic and some are more not metallic. For example, here are two forms of boron. This looks more like a metal. This looks more like a nonmetal and the two forms have more metallic versus non-metallic properties. So the metalloids exhibit properties of both the metals and non-metals. When it comes to the periodic table, metals are found on the left-hand side and actually the left and the center. Everything you see to the left of that sort of red diagonal line there is a metal. All of these elements that split off at the bottom are also metals. In the top right, we have the non-metals above and to the right of this diagonal red series of boxes. And in the red boxes, we have the metalloids along this diagonal that divides the metals and nonmetals. One thing to note here, hydrogen is a nonmetal. It's frequently placed in group one because it bonds similarly to the group one elements and it can form a cation that is analogous to the group one metal cations. You'll also, on some periodic tables, particularly older tables, see hydrogen listed here in group 17, since it absolutely is a non-metal. It's just worth keeping in mind that generally we see metals to the left-hand side of the periodic table. The one exception, and the green color kind of highlights this, is hydrogen. There are four large blocks on the periodic table. They're called the S block here on the left, the P block here on the right, the D block in the middle, and the F block at the bottom. And right now, I just want to point out these blocks just to kind of train your eye to look at the periodic table this way in terms of blocks. The origins of these names will become clear in your introductory chemistry course when you talk about the structure of the atom and why the periodic table looks the way it does. The elements within these blocks have something in common about the way electrons are arranged inside their atoms. That's all I'm going to say about it at this point, but it is worth pointing out the, this distinction between the various blocks because you'll see this terminology throughout your introductory chemistry course, especially after you've talked about the structure of the atom. There are seven non-metallic elements that are diatomic in their elemental forms. Notice that most of the elements, all of the metals, for example, if we were to just write a symbol to represent the element itself, we would just use the element symbols, Cr for chromium, Mg for magnesium, Li for lithium, etc. For some of the non-metal elements, though, they form molecules in the elemental state. So, for example, two hydrogen atoms get together 
to form an H2 molecule in the elemental form of hydrogen on Earth. And these are worth committing to memory because whenever you come across these elements, you should be aware that they're present in diatomic form even as pure elements. And by diatomic, again, and you can see this from the chemical formulas on the slide, this means that the element consists of X2 molecules. There are seven of these worth committing to memory, and they form this mnemonic Brinkelhoff that I like to use. B-R-I-N-C-L-H-O and F. You kind of read all those together, you get Brinkelhoff. These are the diatomic elements. The other thing I would point out is that this is mostly the halogens. The first four halogens form diatomic molecules. Nitrogen and oxygen right next door, and then hydrogen in group one forms diatomic molecules as well. If you need a mnemonic, keep in mind Brinkelhoff. That's pretty much it for our introductory survey of the periodic table. We'll come back to the periodic table on numerous occasions, both in this course and throughout your study of chemistry. But here are two lingering questions to think about as you continue to engage with the periodic table throughout your studies. Why is the periodic table arranged the way it is, is the first question we have. You know, why is there this weird split out down here of these 14 elements? Um, if we were to write the periodic table out in full form, these 14 elements would be shoved here between these two elements here. We don't do that because that would make the table obnoxiously long. But why does that happen? Why are there two elements in e the, why is the S block two elements wide? Why is the P block six elements wide? You'll start to explain this as you investigate the structure of the atom in more detail. I mentioned earlier that the reason we call the rows periods is because of the periodic behavior in the, uh, in the properties of the elements. What are these properties and how do the trends work? What is the atomic origin of these periodic effects? This is something you'll also study in your introductory chemistry course.